So hello and good afternoon. I welcome you to today's special webinar here on FX Street exclusively for JFD brokers. Uh, how to trade the market opening of the U.S. markets. Um, so in fact, yes, we want to have a look at that, uh, at the U.S. markets. And, um, it seems to be honest as if, uh, we are about to see some significant change here, uh, in the markets in, in general. So yesterday you might have seen, especially during the European market hour. So U.S. markets, in fact, were very unspectacular. We'll guide, um, or I'll guide you through several quite interesting uh, developments here which uh yeah usually should have resulted in a more aggressive drop uh in US equities here this did not happen in fact um and these developments already started at um Tuesday but right now we can see around half an hour before US market equity uh, US equities start with the trading day so here is the DAX um German 30 uh, you can see a quite aggressive push on the downside. And um, in fact, it perfectly coincides with my um, outlook in the morning. Uh, when I when I said short term, I think there is some further room on the downside. And in fact, um, it came with a surprise. So no one really, really expected this to happen. So in the morning, we had the DAX long or short. Uh, that's usually a format which um, I run for... Every, which I run every Monday and every Thursday, uh, in the YouTube channel from, from JFD Brokers here at, um, 8.20 a.m. GMT. And, um, there I said, well, I really don't want to formulate a setup here, a trading setup, um, since I don't really see, uh, in which direction the market currently is heading. So yesterday I had a short position on, which played out really well, took some time. Finally, it took off here on the downside and it accelerated. Um, and I, yeah, scored a profit of something like 80, 85 points or so. And uh, the main driver for this was that there were, uh, there was a news from Bloomberg that the Chinese, uh, think about at least reducing, probably don't buying any U.S. Uh, treasuries at all anymore. And this resulted in a, in a quite aggressive drop in the U.S. dollar on a broad scale. Um, so we know that, um, the biggest creditor of the uh, U.S. is uh, China. And um, so now with the Fed also reducing their uh, their their asset purchases, uh, respectively, no, and not just reducing it. This is something which uh, they already, already finished at the end of 2014. No, in fact, they start to reduce their balance sheet. Um, it's one good reason to expect equity, uh, I'm sorry, not equities, um, yields to rise. Um, I, I'll guide you through several um, 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 pictures here in the next uh, 45 to 60 minutes. But, um, right now, nevertheless, we wonder why the market is, um, heading down again. Was there another, another announcement from the, from the Chinese, um, um, government or something? No, in fact, not. But it was, um, not similar, but from a yield perspective, in fact, it was similar. So, uh, the ECB minutes came out several minutes ago and, um, therefore, uh, one, one second, probably. Let me just have a look here. Okay. So one sec. I I just show you the article here in a separate browser tab here. So Euro spikes bonds slide after unexpectedly hawkish ECB minutes. See gradual guidance shift. So in fact. Um, if you look, for example, at um, the developments in the commitment of traders report here over the last um, months, well, probably over the last year, uh, first it was like, one second, let me, let me just see whether I can find a nice chart which will exactly show this again so that everyone has an idea of what I'm talking about right now. It takes a little, one sec. Uh, pop, 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 pop. Here, there we go. So this is uh, the uh, speculation, uh, speculative positioning in futures and a commitment of trader report in the uh, Eurofix future. And what we can see is that the market is aggressively net long. So everyone is definitely surprised to have uh, euro on the one hand, which is currently, um, well, probably from a 
monetary policy perspective from the ECB, one of the cheapest currencies in the G10 currency universe. I think it's uh, still not as cheap as the Japanese yen or the Swiss franc, even though um, it's cheap compared especially to the US dollar, um, which is currently um, seeing a, a yield level of 1.5% after the last rate hike in December here. And uh, so trading from a yield perspective at the same level as, for example, the Australian dollar um, and slightly below the highest uh, um, yielding currency here, the New Zealand dollar with 1.75%. And um, so from this perspective, it's very interesting to see that uh, the euro is so strong and that the market participants, big speculators here, the non-commercials, that they are that, well, they have never been as aggressive long the euro before. It's, it's a record long position. It's, it's uh, not been the case ever that we've seen such a huge long exposure in the euro at all. And um, that's very surprising to see because uh, market participants usually, or obviously, not usually, but obviously are betting that the euro keeps on strengthening here. So the main reason why they do this is somehow very easy. They, they are anticipating um, um, a more hawkish uh, monetary policy from the ECB, even though the ECB keeps on buying bonds with um, 30 billion per month right now till September, market participants right now are already betting that after this, um, the ECB will keep on reducing their asset purchases, probably completely stop them. And nevertheless, it was only speculation so far. No one really knew whether this is the case or not, even though the positioning here and the rec record net long territory suggests that they are very, very confident. Market participants, in this case, non-commercial speculative forces, they are very, very confident that this will happen here and that they will be more restrictive in the near term. And um, so it's not only that the DAX had slower here, but it's also that the euro spikes aggressively higher. And we're not only talking about a small spike, but we're talking about one cent, uh, nearly one cent. Um, the euro gained so far. So this is a four hour chart. We've seen this push higher here yesterday, but it wasn't euro strength. It was, US, it was US dollar weakness. Then the market pushes back again towards a region, which I made already a topic through um, um, or in several morning meetings here. Uh, some Some of you might remember that. And I said the region around 1950 is probably very interesting here uh, to look at for long engagements against which you could consider long engagements with a target of anticipating breaks of the region 121 here. Everything above 117. So this is this region here, um, especially uh, showing showing the December lows here. Everything above 117 should be considered bullish. So that was um, what I what I mentioned through several uh, morning meetings. And, um, yeah, obviously, there must have been something in the ECB minutes, which is right now not just causing the euro to rise, but on the other hand, causing the DAX to lose here. Um, and which then, if we look at it from a, from a little wider perspective here, could probably have bearish and bearish impact here on the U.S. Uh, equity markets too. But first of all, let's have a look at those developments here. So what's happening is the following. Um, the ECB minutes, they have one... One, uh, um, uh, what's the word for this? Uh, here's one excerpt, let's say. That's one excerpt out of this uh, statement. And it says, and this is something you can hear, see in bold, the language pertaining to various dimensions of the monetary policy sense, uh, of the monetary policy stance and forward guidance could be revisited early in the coming year. So this comes with a big bang because no one really expected this. So everyone was expecting that the um, ECB is probably considering reducing their asset purchases um, further or um, um, thinking about uh, how to, to, to end the asset purchases. But no one really expects uh, yields to rise, for example, because in several statements, the ECB made sure that uh, it, it became clear that they see the yields um, staying at the current level uh, for an extended period of time, even after ending the asset purchases. So, and now they are talking about something which is showing that, I mean, what, what, what comes after reducing um, um, asset purchases respectively um, 
completely stopping them. I mean, then the next step is obviously to raise rates. And uh, that's quite clear here, even though it's not mentioned directly, but everyone who reads uh, the statement in this excerpt here uh, reads exactly that. Um, and why do I say that and why I'm so confident saying that? Well, look at the euro. <laughs> that's obvious. So the same is true, by the way. For example, if you look at the Bund here, that's a 10-year um, German yields selling off, coinciding with the statement which was published here at 12.30 p.m. GMT. So uh, the Bund selling off here, losing something like 80 ticks and uh, probably about to lose even more. And, um, yeah, fourth writing, the structure of falling highs and falling lows, which can already uh, be found here um, right from the start of, uh, or right before the beginning of the Christmas season, I'd say. Um, so we already started here with a weaker, weaker bund um, uh, around Christmas, and we are now fourth writing this after consolidation in the first week of trading um, with this quite hawkish statement of the uh, ECB. And now... Well, what we know is, and then we come over to the equity markets, well, what we know is that equities are only trading at a quite elevated and high level for one reason. They're trading here because um, the market, and elevated level, what do I talk about? Is, okay, we're only capable of going back towards uh, January 2015 here. Nevertheless, past uh, here, the election of Donald Trump, the market is only headed in one direction. So um, the DAX had some trouble to forthright this uh, um, upside structure and compared to the U.S. equity markets, it's not as close as strong here. Um, so look at this. I mean, this is like not just an uptrend. It's parabolic, if you want. The market stabilized here for quite a while, and then there was this um, speculation around fiscal stimulus tax cuts after the election of Trump, so the so-called Trump trade. And uh, equities took off here and uh, nearly made something like not really 50%, but close to it. And uh, right here are showing, um, yeah, are definitely showing some significant strength. That's something you have to add here. By the way, we can also um, come, come out here with some statistics. I think it's the second longest run in history that we are trading above the uh, 200 simple moving average here. Um, it's something I have to look up, um, but I think I think this is definitely true. So one second, please. Let's just see whether I can find these stats here again. Um, oh no, it's it's not the it's not the uh, Dow Jones. In fact, it was the S and P, but um, it was where well, it's the same for the S and P too. So. Uh, similar, it's very similar. Um, so in fact, in the S&P, we have seen the longest streak here, trading above the 200 simple moving average here, uh, the second longest streak in history after a period between November 2012 till October 2014 here. But whatever. So the thing is that um, one of the main reasons for this push higher here in the Dow Jones after Trump was uh, the speculation to see tax cuts um, and with this, uh, yeah, with this, with this shadow now, um, coming over from China here and they are quite harsh rhetoric for whatever reason. Probably they just want to fire back after several statements from Trump here, which, um, attacked the Chinese. And it was several, um, uh, I think in German it's faux pas. It's, I don't know whether, whether it's, uh, the same in English. One sec. Let's see. Yeah, it's also faux pas. Um, there are some, let's put this in quotation marks, but I call this a faux pas here in terms of what happened um, around Taiwan, for example, uh, several uh, months ago, last year, during last year. And um, then there were uh, some statements from Trump in terms of the manipulation of the Chinese uh, um, uh, economy through um, devaluating their currency, uh, gaining some advantages here from an expert perspective. And all this um, finally probably... Yeah, resulted in the Chinese taking some action and uh, um, nearly putting out uh, the, let's call it the red button here. Um, what, what do I mean by this? Well, uh, last week there were, uh, there was, uh, um, um, there was, there was uh, yeah, a clash. I don't know. It was more kind of a comedy show, to be honest, uh, when Trump and Kim Jong-un, the uh, 
um, uh, the, 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 the prime minister or the dictator here from North Korea when they compared uh, their their nuclear weapons to each other by talking about uh, the um, who has the the biggest red button here. So uh, it was kind of funny, but what happened yesterday here with the Chinese some some somehow makes the impression that um, China is some some kind of annoyed probably of what's going on here and it's just showing uh, that that um, probably Trump should stop his his attacks here and uh, they should um, find good solutions for their their problems and their interests uh, behind closed doors and not via Twitter let's say so and with this in mind um, I think that the market can withstand the the fear here of of this uh, danger dangerous developments around China, and uh, they are um, announcing that they are considering reducing, respectively stopping their bond purchases. It's uh, putting a sell uh, sign on everything uh, with a U.S. dollar. That is also true for the U.S. equity markets, and so. What right now is probably one of the main reasons why the market can stabilize at these elevated levels here with the tax cuts on one hand and uh, having, let's call, let's call it the global QE here with the um, Bank of Japan buying aggressively assets, still buying, even though at the beginning of the week, and that was the beginning of this drop here in dollar Japanese yen. Um, the main reason for, for the drop here into the start of the week was, um, or it was not the start of the week, but it was Tuesday. It was that the um, Bank of Japan uh, bought, I think, only 190 billion worth of bonds uh, within a duration of 10 to 25 years. If I have the, if I got the numbers correct now, but whatever, and 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 uh, they they at least reduced their their asset purchases here. So now this hawkish statement of the um, of the ECB between the lines. Um, then the announcement from the Chinese probably stopped their uh, purchases of, of U.S. bonds and treasury yields here. So we are probably about to see a spike in treasuries here, uh, in treasury yields here, um, in 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 the near term. And this is causing some 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 problems because the thing is that one of the main reasons why so far. Um, the aggressive leverage we've seen in the market and we still see it in the market. So therefore, let's go over here to Google uh, and let's just Google NYSE leverage and we can look, have a look here at the NYSE margin debt and the markets. The only reason why this leverage, which is um, driven here, we can see that NYSE margin debt is trading at all-time high levels. So we've seen this several times before um, and it didn't end well uh, seeing the market being that aggressively leveraged here. That was around 2007, around or shortly before the uh, uh, financial crisis hit. And the same thing happened here around 2000 with the new economy. And um, so the thing was that especially after uh, Trump's election and when yields spiked higher, therefore let's have a look here at Bloomberg. So in fact, nothing really happened so far um, when looking at When looking at the at the uh, at the at the levels where yields trade right now, so in fact we're trading at the same levels as we traded shortly after the election of Trump. So have a look here. Let's look at five years and have a look here. So when Trump was elected and this Trump trade took uh, took in and this fiscal stimulus speculation um, uh, um, went around the world and pushed especially U.S. equities higher and yields higher. No one really feared um, uh, um, the, the correlation here between rising yields and a potential burst of this of this uh, bubble here uh, in terms of the Nazi margin debt because fiscal stimulus somehow suggests that there's at least some kind of, of uh, economic growth connected to this, probably as aggressive economic growth and inflation really pu pushing aggressively higher based on the fact that we have fiscal stimulus in the U.S., while uh, it is fueled by um, um, asset purchases from the ECB and from the BOJ, to some extent from the Bank of England, to some extent from the SNBs, the, the Swiss National Bank. And this all in all uh, creates a market environment, created a market environment in which we were talking about, to some extent, we talked 
something like um, helicopter money here. And that was one of the reasons why equity markets, especially U.S. equity markets, didn't take a hit on that. Now things are completely different because the market is probably hit by the announcement that monetary policy will be more restrictive in the near term. And this could, especially if we push above that level here, result in a much more and much aggressive, very aggressive move in yields, 10-year yields um, uh, here in this case, pushing us up to 3% probably in no time. And this could cause, if you combine this with risk aversion hitting the market and, and fear coming up, could result in a quite aggressive push lower, which is right now also something which is perfectly explaining why, for example, dollar Japanese yen, which took off here, um, was sold yesterday after the market pushed, pushed to new aggressive highs here in, in yield. So usually you see dollar yen rising um, in the moment uh, U.S. yields push higher. So that was the same where that was that was one. One of the main reasons um, why the market took off that aggressively here um, from October, I'm sorry, November 9th onwards, 2016. But to, as you can see here and as you can see the developments here yesterday, obviously right now we're talking about a complete different game. And this is something which is really causing trouble in the next days, I think, for the markets. And one of the reasons, and now let's finally come to the U.S. market opening, that's one of the reasons why I'm very, 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 very careful in terms of long engagements in U.S. equity markets. If it's the Dow Jones or if it's the S&P, it doesn't really matter. Um, and with this in mind, I, I think it's definitely very, very difficult here to formulate um, uh, long engagements with positive risk-reward ratios or, let's say, with... Um, not at least, even if you say, and I probably say that's definitely true. Some, some might say, hey, if you have a trading system, which is working well, and the strategy I present to you here in the uh, next few minutes, um, let me just show you, where do I have this? I think it's here. And let's have a look here at this chart. So if you look at this chart, you can clearly see that the strategy obviously has a positive expected value. So it's going from here, from the from the uh, um, lower left to the upper right, which is showing the market. Or, um, I'm sorry, the, the strategy is obviously uh, making money. And we're talking about we're talking about um, over 1,000 uh, um, um, trades here, nearly 1,500 trades. We are talking about a time frame of more than seven years of back test. Um, um, data here or data we back tested, let's put it that way. And um, so the strategy itself is obviously trading with a positive expected value. And with this in mind, um, there's, to be honest, no real reason to keep on following the trend. And if we are gener if we get to see um, 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 a setup here generated uh, on the long side, and that's currently the picture we can draw here in the S&P then. So we have the time frame from uh, 2.30 p.m. GMT till 9 p.m. GMT. I'm sorry, 2.30? Yeah, no, it's it's 2.30. 2.30 PMT, PM GMT, and here it's 9 PM GMT. You can see uh, um, here the red line, the high from yesterday. You can see the green line, that's the low from yesterday. Um, so if we are now breaking out of this um, um, open range, which has to, to uh, or which will be defined between um, 2.30 PM till uh 3.15 p.m. GMT, um, if we break out on the upside and we are trading above this yellow line, which is showing the 10 exponential moving average 10 on a 50 minute time frame, well, there's no reason not to trade the long side, even though from, uh, from the, from the uh, bigger time frame, I definitely think it's worth to consider uh, reduced position size here since um, the overall picture is, again, very, very extended. And with all these small fires now um, summing up, I think we can definitely, uh, well, I'm not talking about an apocalypse here or something, but I think a sharp drop in the equity markets is definitely imminent and um, about to come around the corner, and we should definitely be prepared to see something like that. So that's one of the reasons, for example, why I should or would say, okay, if we trade the long side because the system sell, tells us to do so, I do it with the reduced position size. But if I trade the short side, I'd probably go with a, with a more aggressive approach here, probably increase the risk of, let's say, 
initially it's 1% to go up to like 1.5% or so. Um, there's only one, one small problem as, as usual. Um, there's always two sides to the coin. So if you look at the VIX here, what you can see is that the volatility index on the S&P 500 is still trading below 10. That's one other reason to be not too cheerful here in terms or the expectance shouldn't be too high in terms of a, of a potential drop we could see in the U.S. equity markets. Because as long as we trade below 10 here, or at least if we're trading around 10, um, it's a clear sign that the market is still selling volatility here and is not expecting big moves to happen. And um, so... With this in mind, it's definitely uh, worth to probably reconsider um, a too aggressive engagement. Probably it's like, let's say, trade the, the short side with, um, let's call it normal risk here. So let's say if you're, if you're risking 1%, we're going with 1% risk per trade. And if the market really starts to show uh, the willingness to push further on the downside, we have the chance to add to our intraday position or consider more aggressive engagements uh, the day after them. I mean, this is an intraday trading strategy, making it possible to consider the market every day. And we could definitely take a more aggressive approach than tomorrow when the market has already clearly shown that it wants to, to, to now start a bigger corrective move, which could, by the way, and therefore let's switch over here to the daily chart, which could push us as minimum as low as 2,700 points. Uh, look at the current readings here. So this is a 1% drop of 50 points, which is already int um, already um, um, quite attractive, I think, from a risk-reward perspective. And the same is true even if, if the market keeps on pushing even more aggressive on the downside. Um, uh, so we haven't seen, since the election of Trump here in November 2016, we haven't seen a 3% drop in, in U.S. equity markets. And um, with this in mind and volatility being that low, the thing is that we have some some good reason to believe that the moment the market is really hit hard um, and volatility picks up, uh, it could result after a drop of something like one, probably one and a half percent. If it somewhere in the future happens that this could be the beginning of an even sharper drop here. Uh, which could easily drive markets three, three and a half, four percent lower. Since, from a statistical standpoint, we're currently talking about something like I don't know, I haven't, I haven't looked it up, but something like a four sigma event or something like that. So ridiculously um, a low vo um, 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 probability that something like that will happen. But if it finally happens, and we know it, it will, it, it will be considered as kind of a black swan. And with market being that aggressively short volatility, there's a good, good chance that um, this could be the beginning of a very, very strong and very um, aggressive move on the downside, which adds then to the potential of existing short positions and could be, um, uh, yeah, could be very attractive in terms of risk reward and to the, the risk reward to be expected here from such an engagement. Okay, I I uh I welcome you, uh Khaled from Egypt. So uh I, I'm not sure if the question is, is for me. Uh it, it's uh the question how long um the uh um a webinar will, will take here. So so the time of, of this webinar I think will end in around thirty minutes. So it's um uh, set to take place between two and three uh PM London time. So GMT right now. Um, and we're doing this nevertheless. If, if you're, if you're, um, uh, right now tuning in, uh, you have one chance. You can, uh, set up, uh, you can look up the, the recording of the, uh, a webinar here, um, afterwards. And we are here every, uh, uh, Thursday. So same time. Uh, and at the first of, of, um, uh, each month. So it means that the first, in this case, the first Thursday, it's the day before, uh, the NFPs. So the first Friday usually is the day when the NFPs are announced. What we decided to do is to have a special event here with um, some ideas on what to expect on the NFPs. And um, in fact, by the way, uh, let, let's just probably have a look back here at this. Um, one sec. Uh, 
I just have to to put this turquoise line here higher. Why do I do this? It's simple. It's uh, the first tick at um, at 3:50 at uh, 3:30 p.m. G uh, German time in this case, so 2:30 p.m. GMT. So this is the the, the opening price um, here. It's only for for me for information purposes. As is the the blue line, for example, which is showing the last tick here uh, at 9 p.m. GMT yesterday. That was the last tick during uh, the spot market was open. And um, so right here, you can see that the market already started and is so far pushing one point lower. Nothing big is happening here. Um, so based on that, uh, first of all, wow. So that's a clear message from the market, by the way. Um, so we, we have to look up here, USD, for example. It was very interesting to see last week um, how much of the non farm payables was already priced in. So probably let me do the following. Let us just look up here on the presentation from last week. Just have to see. I think it's this one. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so one sec. It's uh, so NFP said I had which scenarios to expect. And then you see here that the chances of another rate hike here was something like uh, a 68% um, when I presented this. So here you have the consensus. That was what in fact happened. Uh, you have to say in terms of the, of the uh, uh, NFP reading, in fact, the other numbers came in as expected. So unemployment rate came in as with 4.1%. Average hourly earnings came in with 0.3% as expected. The only number which disappointed, which was surprising, uh, um, which, or which caught the market by surprise, was the, uh, um, uh, was the number here um, around the NFPs itself, which uh, came in below expectation. In fact, it came in, let me just think about this, 148, I think so. Yeah, 150, I, I don't know. Uh, but definitely it came in below expectation, which was 190,000. So now let's have a look here what happened to EURUSD, but also to dollar yen and also to gold. Um, it was very, very interesting to see that, in fact, EURUSD, for example, reacted bullish. Um, and here you can see the retest of the regional 121 um, and potential break possible. So until here, retest of the region 121, um, it was perfect, was a perfect um, 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 analysis, to be honest. Here, you can see this. That was the, the, the candle, the four-hour candle, which pushed us as high as 120.84 here. And then we sold off from there. And why did this happen? Why did the break not happen here? Um, I think the main reason was because much of, of this reading here around the NFPs was already priced in. So the numbers came in below expectation, even though the number around the unemployment rate, for example, or and or the average hourly earnings came in as expected, which made the overall um, uh, reading a mixed one, let's say. And uh, if you then look at the fact, you can already see this here in EURUSD, EURUSD started to take off here around uh, one week before Christmas, um, traded around 1750 and then pushed as high as 121 in the uh, upcoming days um, before and before Christmas and then between Christmas and New Year's Eve. You can see that the market already priced in US dollar weakness. And so uh, this development here around the NFPs didn't come with such a big surprise that the market did not significantly break above 121, but in fact sold off from here. Um, the only thing why I'm a little, let's say, frustrated is because in after the NFPs and after this reaction here and seeing the market stabilizing then around something like 2030, um, and that was, by the way, the region around the daily uh, lows um, um, last week on, on Friday. The only thing why I'm a little frustrated is because I didn't want to trade on a gut feeling. I was right, uh, and, and I'm, I'm honest here. So I was really thinking, okay, now I just short the euro here. Um, I was um, 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 already seeing a perfect stop here, something around 120, 120 90, 121. Um, so having a risk of something like 60 to 70 pips. And I was thinking to sell something like half a million here. Um, uh, that was uh, where it's mainly based on the account size I'm trading. So I was willing to risk something like 
Yeah, 0.8 to to one percent here on this trade, and um, because and that was the reason because I I thought much of this news was already priced in. We have a very strong sentiment extreme in the commitment of trades report as already shown, and here on a four hour chart you can see that the market slightly pushed higher before the NFPs, so they were published on the fifth, while we made slightly higher highs here on the fourth of January. While this wasn't um, confirmed here in the RSI anymore, that's usually a great combination and, and something I work with when trading from a pure discretionary uh, based perspective. And I was thinking about um, shorting EURUSD here, really. And um, then the market really sold off from there. And in fact, the target, as mentioned um, um, uh, in, in several morning meetings, um, was around 119.50. So I was aiming for a risk reward of something like. 1.5 to 1 minimum, probably one or 2 to 1. And um, yeah, unfortunately, again, I, I, I decided against it because I said, well, it's it's too much gut feeling here and that's why I'm not trading the trade. So that's the only reason why I'm a little frustrated, even though my thoughts were, were fine. And so from a research perspective, at least I can say, okay, well, worked out somehow. Um, more interesting, I think, dollar yen, we have to skip this a little because um, the reaction was similar, even though um, right now with the developments in the days after, it's, uh, we, are, we, are, we have a too strong bias here, so it doesn't make sense, I think, from a cognitive uh, perspective to, to look at this uh, um, developments here in dollar yen. But let's have a look here at gold. So neutral to bullish, quite extended after the run of last week's probably retest of the region around 1,320. And in fact, the same thing happened here in gold too. So gold, that was uh, the fifth, that was here. Gold started the day last week weaker, sold off a little, and then pushed higher towards, again, the region of 130.20. What I think is really interesting to see right now, um, so the, the, the uh, idea here played out really well, so the scenario played out as expected. But what I think is really interesting is the fact that right now gold can stabilize here at these elevated levels. So you can see that gold has already pushed higher. Um, from the midst of uh, um, December on, similar to the euro. So US dollar weakened based on yields coming coming down and gold pushed aggressively higher, also driven, mainly driven probably from the fact that the seasonal, seasonal patterns right now suggest uh, gold um, a bullishness here. And now the interesting thing is gold is stabilizing at this elevated level and can stabilize here even though in the meantime and after um, the... After the, the, the NFPs came in mixed, but still um, better than expected for those who were betting on a, on, a, on a bearish outcome for the U.S. dollar, even gold can stabilize at these level after gold uh, the U.S. dollar pushed slightly higher. And this is giving us some, I think, some clear sign that probably, probably gold will not do what I somehow hope gold to do. Um, to push higher from here. So, in fact, my outlook for gold in the midterm, upcoming months, is positive. I think that we have a very good chance to see gold pushing up to 1,400 USD, probably even higher than that. Um, with having a weaker US dollar in mind, in fact, I'm not betting here on the Chinese putting pressure on the US dollar, but my main um, intention of having um, a bearish outlook for the US dollar while having a positive, positive and bullish one for gold is more that I consider chances to be high that the U.S. Uh, um, economy could um, see a recession in the near term. That's also one of the reasons um, where, well, have a look at, at the yield curve here, at the difference between two and 10 year, the yield differential between two and 10 year yields. Uh, it's suggesting that the U.S. economy will aggressively slow down, probably see a recession uh, within the next 12 months here. And um, so with this farming at the horizon, I think that gold is probably a very attractive buy um, still, again, in this region also. But I somehow prefer gold pushing towards 1,285 to 280 here. Um, th still, I think that this is giving a more attractive risk reward here. Hopefully, I'm not too greedy, but right now it seems as if I'm too greedy because gold is really presenting itself really strong here um, on this on this um, overall picture, which is somehow um, um, 
well, it has shown some US dollar correction here over the last days, which gold was uh, capable of withstanding with no real problem here and stabilizing at quite elevated level, which is, yeah, which is really, really, really strong. So yeah, that is, that is on gold. And and uh, if if some of you were wondering um, what happened to these scenarios here, and uh, as last week already um, uh, um, said, um, I, I want to give a review of these data here from from the uh, from from last week. Um, so now now more important. Um, Again, why, why do I have, by the way, why do I have a look here at, at, uh, at the DAX all the time? That has to do with the fact that I'm somehow, I mean, I've, I've drawn a quite bearish picture here for U.S. equity markets, and we know about the positive correlation um, between, oh, we can, well, probably we can keep this here. I'd probably do it somewhere like that. Um, so, the thing is that um, uh, the, the the money I'm trading um, that's something I do for clients. Um, it's mainly DAX based, so I'm I'm most of the time trade the DAX here. And uh, what I do is that 80 percent, 90 percent of the time, I'm trading a systemized approach here. Um, and today I intervened from a discretionary perspective. And the reason why I did that was uh, because I think or I thought that we have some further potential on the downside. So I had a short position on Tuesday. I had one on Wednesday. And um, I kept the short position from Tuesday where the position did not work out as expected, but was trading around break even. And I had a very, very strong feeling that we are probably about to see a move lower here in the DAX. That was also mainly due to this bearish divergent, which formed here. And after this huge extended move on the upside, um, after the market here took off from last week, Wednesday, Thursday, and, and Friday. And so based on that, I kept this position, played out here, as you can see, and today the system would have been long. Um, for whatever reason, that doesn't really matter. But it, the system would have been long, and I'm, I was of the opinion that we are not yet done on the downside. And that's one of the reasons why I took out the trade. So now some might say, hey, uh, does that make sense? Didn't you just say gut feelings are probably not really uh, the the way you should trade? I 100% agree, um, but I want to to uh, present to you um, a concept here, which is I think heavily underestimated from many out there, and um, I will just present to you the most important formula in trading. Um, which everyone has to write down to study and to understand. And in fact, we all know this formula because um, the thing is that uh, in every trading book, you can read from every great trading guru out there, make winning trades great and cut losing trades short. And it all comes down to this formula here around the expected value. So what can you expect after a series of trades here to gain out of your trading. Average losing trade, multiply this with the loss rate. So and what do I do here in my trading is I have a, systemat a systemized approach and I know the expected value of this approach. Um, that's, by the way, one of the reasons why um, everyone is recommended to have a trading journal. Write down all your trades. Be as detailed as possible on, on your feelings on all this because it makes it easier for you in the, um, in the future to see what you have to change. Why did you behave that way? Was it the first time you behaved the way you behaved? <clears throat> but it's also, and this is more important now to this thought here, it's not just interesting from a psychological standpoint, but it's also very interesting from a purely mathematical standpoint. So the formula around the expected value it makes it possible if you uh, really uh, write down your trades in detail to filter out your hit rate, to filter out your loss rate, and to also filter out the average winning trade you, you produce and the average losing trade you produce. And so what I know, for example, is that um, here my, my expected value in every trade is something like 10 cents per euro I risk per trade. So that doesn't make may sound a lot of money, but the thing is, 10 cents means if I'm risking on a account which is currently bigger than a quarter million, I think. Um, yeah, so I have to look it up. It's something like a quarter million, probably 300,000, something like that. doesn't really matter. If I risk 1% here, um, that means 
let's say quarter million is 2,500 euros and I'm making 10 cents on every euro I risk here. So that means nothing more than I'm making 250 euros for, for, for every trade I do. So every trade is 250 euros win or 250 euros gain. So that is also true for losing trades. If I keep on trading this approach here and I'm capable of stabilizing those parameters around the average winning trade, the hit rate, by the way, there's a T missing, uh, the losing trade, the average losing trade and the loss rate. If I can stabilize it here, I can expect, I can expect to make 250 euros per trade. It doesn't matter if it's winning or it's a losing trade. And now let's assume I'm making something like 200 trades a year. Um, that means I'm multiplying 200 with those 250 euros, which um, adds up to 50,000 euros. And if I divide this by the account size, I'm trading a quarter million. That means I'm making 20%. Okay. So if the expected value here, if this number, after putting in all those numbers here based on uh, your input parameters from your trading journal, gives you an expected value of, let's say, 10 cents, you look at the amount you risk per trade. And if the amount you risk per trade, uh, uh, if the amount in euro of risk per trade is 1% of your equity, let's assume it's a 10,000 euro account, you're um, um, risking 1%, which equals to 100 euros, and your expected value is 10 cents, well, you're making 10 euros per trade. doesn't matter if it's a winning or losing trade. If you keep on trading this strategy over and over and over again, you're making for every trade um, 10 euros on average. And if you do this 200 times and keep on doing trading this over and over and over again, stabilize those parameters and keep on trading with a positive expected value in the case of, of 10 euros per trade multiplied with 200, you make 2000 euros a year, 2000 euros a year. If you put this in relation to the 10,000 euro account you're trading, we're talking about 20% per annum you're making. And this is how profitability in trading comes into play. And so now let's make long thing short. So I was talking about the system being long today while the market is obviously under pressure here. So what do I do is if I take out the system today based on my research, um, based on my experience, based on my gut feeling, for example, um, what I try to achieve is the following. I try on one hand to reduce the losing rate here. So obviously, and if um, things go as expected right now, the trade would have been a loser. So far, it's something like nearly 100 points, uh, points um, 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 underwater, this trade. Um, so I can use uh, reduce the loss rate. Um, and on the other hand, obviously, when I'm capable of, for example, and this is also a component I try to, to manage here, when I'm usually um, seeing a loss of something like, in this case, um, 800 euros, let's say. So this is the average losing trade. In fact, it's, it's very close to, to the, uh, to the overall, um, uh, um, numbers I have here for nearly, yeah, two, two years. I'm, I'm managing clients' money now on this account. It's something like 800 euros. So, and now, um, I'm not facing a loss here of something like one and a half to 2000 euros. This will add positively to the average losing trade because here, instead of facing a loser of 1500 euros for the day, which is twice as high as the 800, which I usually average here, um, it means that I can reduce this number to zero because I'm not trading today and I'm not facing this losing trade. So this is putting a positive impact on this component average losing trade here. So it makes sure that my hit rate increases, right? the loss rate decreases, and the average losing trade drops. So what happens all in all is, if you really understand and study this formula here, what happens is that this term here is going down. And so while you have a minus in front of it, it means that you're subtracting a lower number. And this is adding positively to your overall expected value. So some of you, this probably sounds a little nerdy. That's too much mathematics. But in fact, this is a basic concept. Everyone who wants to trade professionally, everyone who wants to trade profitable, um, needs to understand. In fact, it all comes down to this formula. If you understand this formula, everything's fine and you're perfectly off. And then you start to really find a strategy which has a positive expected value. And then you try to, to play a little with the numbers. You write those numbers down and then you will find ways to positively 
impact your trading every time. So even if I now present to you the strategy, and by the way, I, I, I want to, to give you here um, a screenshot, the chance to take a screenshot of the, set, um, of the strategy. So I, I told you that here uh, that I will present you the strategy which underlies this equity curve over the last seven years. And by the way, look at these numbers. Number of trades, you have the win rate here, you have the average profit, you have the average loss. So what does this mean? Well, it means nothing more than with those numbers here, you're capable of working through this formula. Average winning trade, which is 1.08. You have the average losing trade, one minus 1. Uh, 0.82. So in fact, you don't need to put in the, the minus here so because it's already here. And you have the hit rate, which is 47%. Percent and you have the, lose, the loss rate, which is 53. So what does that mean? Expect value. Let's shorten things up here. It's EV. And then you say, in fact, you can already put in average profit to average loss. If you um, um, build the ratio here, you get 1.31. So let's work with this number. It makes things easier to, to multiply them. So this is what you get then. So average profit, 1.08 divided by 0 0.82 comes out 1.31 to 1. And I do this because it makes things easier now to multiply things here. So it's, uh, it's in fact 1, and you can multiply this then here with 53. And what you get, oh, I'm sorry, what you get is 0 0.61. By the way, I'm sorry. Uh, so in, in Germany, we're working with commas here. So and I know in the English-speaking world, it's dots we have to work with. So, okay, and then you get the following result here, which means with this strategy, you're making on average eight cents per euro you risk. Now, again, you're doing this 1,347 times. If you're trading a 10,000 euro account, it means that you are um, uh, that you are that you are risking 100 euros here. Let's say um, 100 euros. You multiply this with eight cents. It's on average eight euros you make per trade. You might think, well, this is not a lot. Well, you do this 1,347 times. That means uh, that after seven years of trading, you double the account. So the overall result here, um, not considering um, um, uh, commissions and all that stuff, probably it's slightly below that, but all in all, the account is traded up from 10 to 20,000 euros. Um, and uh, so doubling the account, you might say, in seven years, is that is that great? Well, just imagine you're buying a house, let's say. So consider your trading account to be an investment. That's nothing more than that, right? So it, it's like consider your trading account to be an investment and get rid of all these get quick, uh, get rich quick schemes or something. Like that doesn't make sense. It's like you're doing this over and over again in a very disciplined way and you're trading the strategy because you know it's profitable. And probably you face a losing trade today from a positive or from an expected value perspective, you know, even if it was a losing trade, which is by the way happening 53% of the time here. So you're losing more times than you're winning. Even those times you're losing, you're winning because you're trading with a positive expected value. This is a, this is something you, you really have to, to start to understand and to believe in. It's, it's very in, interesting, in fact, that uh, um, the average uh, um, human being has trouble to think in terms of uh, probability. It's, it's very difficult. So let's assume um, you were watching these uh, disastrous developments around 9-11 and the World Trade Center. And you were looking at this and afterwards you just decided, okay, I won't enter a plane anymore because it's too, it's it's just too, too dangerous. I, I it's it's just too dangerous. I don't will I will never ever ever enter a plane anymore. The interesting thing is that some data afterwards showed that um, I don't know, three, four, five times, um, more people died afterwards, not using a plane, but instead going by train or going by car or whatever, that more than. Yeah, I don't know. Let's say five times uh, as much people died afterwards um, um, after these developments at 9-11 um, as would have died in another plane crash. So and uh, that that's I mean, that's a very drastically um, and it's a very 
yeah, probably not the best um, um, example here. Nevertheless, it perfectly shows that many people have trouble to understand statistical significance here. And that's something you really have to, to believe in. Yeah, you really have to understand that if you want to become a successful trader. And it all comes, in fact, down here towards expected value. So, by the way, if you're interested, that's one of the reasons why I'm talking about this. So, yesterday I had a, a discussion with another trader. And um, he was um, referring to some developments in the poker world. So we are both uh, playing some pokers from time to time. Uh, not not as much as we were used to several years ago, um, but we are still um, playing some home games. And um, so the interesting thing here is that he referred to a development um, around uh, one woman. Her name is Vanessa Selbst, and uh, she's a very successful poker player. And um, she moved on to to uh, to work for a hedge fund here. So she um, um, uh, was was a uh, was an um, um, what was it? It was uh, she she had a marketing deal or something like that with with poker stars. And then she just quit this deal, and uh, everyone was wondering why, because some might say that it was definitely a very lucrative one. Uh, nevertheless, she, she joined Bridgewater and we were discussing about women being sus- potentially successful traders. And, um, I, um, um, referred to an interview from another great woman, uh, in the, in the poker world. Um, her name is Annie Duke. And, uh, she gave an interview here on trading and, and how she, uh, consults, uh, former poker players to, who wants to become traders, but also in general traders. And um, if you're interested, just shoot me an email um, um, so I can t- uh, forward you this 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 interview here. Um, and this is exactly showing why thinking in uh, terms of probabilities here is so important to successful traders. Um, yeah, so that's it around that. Um, so now let's come back here, first of all, to this screenshot. Um, again, um, we, we, we don't have the time, so we need another 15 minutes, which we unfortunately do not have here, to wait for the uh, range to, to define itself. But um, it's very easy, in fact, the setup itself, and it plays out as this, this um, um, equity graph shows. So we find the open range between 2.30 p.m. and 3.15 p.m. GMT. So this is uh, the time in which we define the open range. So which means we're looking at the high and we're looking at the low here. So let's have a look here at the S&P 500. So currently, uh, S&P is pushing higher again. So the low is 2,752.5. That's here. And currently, um, the S&P is about to see a push, um, which is bringing this open range to more than um, six points, which is, in fact, necessary because um, I want to see an open range which is bigger than 0.5%. And if you have defined the high and the low of this time frame here, uh, we identify the advantage via, in fact, we, we uh, ignore the Dell theory here, we um, identify the advantage based on the 50-minute exponential moving average 10, and uh, simply saying, hey, if we trade above that, we're going long. If we trade below that, we're going short, meaning... If here the range now uh, say it's it's something like showing a high at 2,758, um, and we are breaking above this high, we are trading above the yellow line, which is the exponential moving average 10 here on a 50 minute time frame. We're going long, placing the stop below the low of the range. So meaning if the low is 2,752.5, this is where we place the stop, and um, in fact that's it. So then uh, we trade the. Yeah, this is point three already. We trade the break of the open range in direction of the identified advantage, stop above below the high low of the range. That's the setup. And um, again, as already said during the first minutes of this webinar, I'd trade this with a reduced position size because of the very extended mode on the upside and uh, potential, yeah, yeah, fear probably building, nervousness building around some several uh, several developments around China and also the ECB with their quite hawkish um, statement um, today, so the, the ECB minutes. And um, nevertheless, that's in fact the setup here. And uh, now you wonder, okay, and what about the stop management? In fact, it's a make or break trade. So we keep the position open as long as it's stopped out or um, we close it then automatically at 8.50 p.m. GMT. So we keep the position open. We could work with take profit targets and all that stuff, but in fact, it, um, it is uh, um, 
the, the concept behind the strategy is in fact that we um, don't use any take profits, but in fact we um, say, okay, uh, we close the position at 8:50 p.m. GMT um, at whatever price it might it might trade, and um, based on the uh, assumption that it wasn't stopped out before, and um, you can see that this is generating in fact positive positive result here, and uh, it's, it's a trading strategy with a positive expected value. And um, so, yeah, in fact, that's it from my end. I hope you enjoyed uh, the webinar. Um, please shoot me an email if you have any questions. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's that's it from my end. Um, happy trading. Watch your stops. Talk to you again then next week on 2, 2 p.m. Uh, GMT slash London time. Um, I definitely will forward to, uh, look forward to it and uh, wish you happy trading. Take care, see you, and bye-bye.